Hello, good morning. Thank you very much for the very interesting speech you have uh, given to us. Uh, I would like to ask about the quality of the publications. Uh, how can we ensure that the peer review is an easy way to manage uh, during the publishing? Just to, to make our researchers feeling more comfortable that everything will be fine, uh, there is not any threat about opening access, open access publishing. Just your experience. Yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you, Elena. Uh, I think uh, one thing to clarify, yes, is that open access um, is a concept that is um, not related to quality. For example, uh, as is closed access, so you can have open access journals, for example, or other publication venues, and closed ones. You could have a bad open access journal and a bad subscription journal, as the same way you can have a good open access journal and a bad closed and a good uh, closed journal. So, so openness refers only to the mode of the availability. So it does, it's not related. I guess some um, researchers do have a fear that openness and open access journals are um, related to quality journals. What is basically happening is that the system that we had thus far was a subscription system, right? Which is still the prevalent system. So some very accomplished journals are now closed. And the problem with this is that many times um, journals that are open uh, could be newer, newer journals, so they've not yet made it into the top list that universities require for, um, you know, for, uh, from the researchers to publish in. Uh, but I should say that uh, at least in some um, fields, most of the journals are actually open. So, you know, biomedical research, most of the publishing there is already open access. So primarily open access, huh? but so Biomed Central, PLOS, I mean, just to name a number of, uh, of uh, venues. So I think these concerns mostly um, derive from, from other disciplines that are not as used to publishing uh, in, in open access. I mean, I don't know what to say. So, so one thing to say is that open access is not, I mean, you can find very, very good journals in open access. Yes, you need to do your work. And, and go to the directory of open access journals and look uh, for these uh, journals. Uh, and second, to say that yes, the, the institutional frameworks are not exactly following the, the developments in technology that enable open access and the practices of innovative researchers. So uh, there we do, we, do, we do need a change from institutions to um, uh, to, in order to encourage, you know, openness and open access publishing and open access through repositories. But if you must uh, write in, in a closed journal, in a tall journal, then you should give open access through the repository. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if there's no other way, then um, I guess it, it, it also, uh, open access m at this point means changing the cultures of the researchers themselves, who of course follow the institutional cultures, which are rather conservative, okay? So it's understandable that, that there might be reservations, although we are moving to the right direction, but um, it, it, it is part of the responsibility of the researchers as well to do a bit of their research as to where to publish and to, uh, to, to understand that it's to their benefit to give more more access. So in the event that they cannot find an open access venue to publish their work, uh, they may be obliged, so if Cyprus move on to their, to their um, if, um, uh, national and institutional policies, they will be obliged to provide open access, but they also have their repositories. So use your institutional repository, especially if you have one, such as the University of Cyprus. If you don't have one still, you do have Zenodo, which is a um, you know, paid for uh, by the EU largely uh, to make your, uh, your work open. I mean, you probably mo already do that in Academia ADU or ResearchGate. I mean, your institutional repository and those publicly funded repositories are, I would be the first place that I would put my work um, in as well. So there are, there are ways of providing open access. But um, the main point is accessibility is not in any way connected to, to the quality of, uh, of the venues. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Do we have to separate quality and open access? So yeah, it's a different discussion. Open access, but the quality yeah. is a very different. It's a different, it's a different. 
the quality of the peer-reviewed uh, material. But on the other hand, if we talk about the social sciences and humanities, uh, there will be the, in my opinion, the problem. If we talk about the scientific and uh, uh, sciences uh, such as uh, results from the CER, the quality has to be, it is by its own. So uh, I believe that uh, is a very clear and we have to clear right, uh, clarify that. Uh, open access is something different and the quality is something different and so we have to focus on that. So, so for, uh, sorry for the corruption. Sure, uh, no problem. Um, all, all, the point I was going to make is only that the policymakers have a very important role in altering perceptions around the quality of open access journals. And we've seen in the European uh, context where FP8, Horizon 2020, has an open access mandate. Now, you, if you're funded by Horizon 2020, you must publish in open access. That sends a very, very clear signal to researchers that it is treated seriously by the Commission. In the UK, if you want to submit your research to the Research Excellence Framework, which is the means by which institutional research income is distributed, you must publish in open access as well. So when the policymakers are behind this, then everything else falls into place, I think. Well, wait, yes, but here, no, we have the, the, the UK policies are rather particular in that they, the, 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 the UK policymakers require open access. RCUK requires open access, which is a rather, I mean, only very few countries have. Most policymakers require deposit to repositories and open access to repositories, which is also what Horizon requires. But what Horizon says, though, which is effectively that if, you're, if your publisher does not allow you to provide open access in the time frame that we require, which is six months for the, the embargo for the natural sciences and, and 12 months for the social science, effectively then you need to find an open access publisher. They don't say this very loud, but this is what they say. So, so, if, so if I wanted to publish in, I don't know, Elsevier, XX blocked, uh, tall subscription thing that has a two year embargo, according to Horizon, I can't. So I need to find another venue, which needs to be, I guess, an open access publisher because, or, or some other subscription publisher that has lesser embargoes. So this is quite, he's very right that the policy makers uh, the tone that they give is very important. But when you have the, I think effectively this is what happens when you have the researchers that, you know, my institution, because I was, uh, we had a training with some uh, Nordic uh, researchers uh, recently and said, okay, the list, they were I think in business, the list of journals that my institution requires me to publish in are all tall journals. And this, so there, these are the A-class journals and I need to have, you know, one article per year and they're all closed. What am I going to do? So this is, um, so, so then the perception follows that if it's an open access journal, it's not as good because it's not in that list. So this will require also the flipping mm -hmm. of this. So if, the, if this very same journal that Elsevier has is now is not a subscription journal, but is suddenly flipped into an open access journal and the, uh, and the access to it is, is free to all, but the institutions pay upfront for it, then the researcher will probably be, you know, fine, you know, it's the same journal, great, it's open access now, yeah. but... but the, uh, the, the, the other side of that is that if uh, the, the, the funders uh, play hardball and insist that, that things are published in these journals, the, the journals are not going to be intransigent, their policies adapt to real politic, yeah. uh, and uh, if all of the scholars in that area suddenly stop submitting to that journal because it has a two-year embargo. I think you'll quickly find it becomes a one-year embargo. <laughs> yeah, no, it's right. And actually, I think it seems that uh, scholars are recently understanding also um, the significance and, and, and some being more meaningfully engaged in publishing. And I heard about this new initiative in a recent event about alternative publishing ways in, um, in uh, Brussels. So there's these linguists that are, are basically effectively retracting, are in the process of retracting these five flagship journals from Elsevier and some other publishers. They want to flip them into open access journals, 
but they want to flip them with very low costs, which effectively will be less money for the big publishers. But uh, if they don't agree, uh, the Dutch universities have agreed to give money to them to pay off the publisher to get rid of them, basically to break their contracts with their publishers. And these journals will go into this uh, new initiative, the Open uh, Library of the Humanities. So the humanities are actually moving forward as well. And, and they will adopt the journals and will work, um, will basically support the Open Library of the Humanities to publish them in a f more fair way. So I think it's important for you, if you're mainly librarians, how many, how many of you are researchers again, I think? A few, okay. Both for researchers to be aware you know, what it means to be, you know, what, what is fairness in publishing, actually, and understanding a bit of the costs that are involved in being able to access work, um, as well as, of course, as the policymakers where, where they spend their money. But there are these very, very interesting initiatives going on with, uh, with open access also in the humanities. Um. Sure. <laughs> So I was involved in the creation of the national policy. And uh, we feel that we don't have the mechanism to control the data thing. <laughs> the data thing, yes. Uh, so how uh, we can monitor the quality is one issue how we can uh, um, help maybe the repository managers uh, with the um, um, format of the data. Uh, does the data, does a data management plan will help in all these issues so that we can finally say as the team of the creation of the national policy that yes, we can support this part Okay, so the, the, there are three constituent parts to our research data management policy, strategy, service. And, and broadly speaking, these are the technical infrastructure, so the, 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 the um, repository software, the networks which connect them, etc., the cataloging, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's the human side of things, which is having staff who are aware, able to, to staff the service, but also uh, the, the, the the people who deposit within the service uh, are also aware of, uh, you know, their obligations, their expectations, all that. And the third is the hardest one, which is the money, because without, res if you've got two of those three things, it doesn't work. You need to have all three of these things uh, in place uh, if you're going to have an, an effective uh, service. So th th there are initiatives within Europe to assist with the development of um, uh, of research data services. In, in, some, uh, in some countries, this is done on, a, on an institutional basis. So I work at Edinburgh University, which is a, a, a large and intensive research university, and we have our own research data services. We have consultants that can be brought in from the library to advise researchers and what have you. But I also work on a national basis, and I go to much smaller universities uh, that, that have only been universities since 1992, when all of the polytechnics became universities in the UK. Uh, and they have much smaller research portfolios much smaller amounts of research funding, and it's a great challenge for them to meet the expectations of policymakers when those policies are influenced and derived by what, what's called in the UK the Russell Group, which is the intensive univers uh, research intensive uh, universities club. So it, it, it's unfair and it's unrealistic to expect all of the 165 universities in, in the UK to have research data services of the same size, of the same um, uh, standard, etc. Um, the, 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 there's certainly a great deal of scope within countries and across European countries for collaboration and, and sharing not only of services, of infrastructure, but of, of staff. Uh, and one of the things I'm very interested in, in at the moment is how to encourage and how to seed inter, you know, cross-national collaborations maybe on a geographical basis. I mean, that, that, that's a sensible way to do it. Sometimes on a linguistic basis is, is useful as well. Um, but there's certainly no reason for uh, all of the EU member states to have yeah. the, 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 their own. So I, I, I came here via Latvia, another of the smaller uh, European member states, and they have the same problems that 
simply put, the UK and Germany uh, <laughs> do not have, you know, so. I think Martin is very right here. I mean, you need to collaborate. Cyprus is a small country. I don't think at this point, I mean, necessarily you need to have, um, you know, your own data repository, for example. Uh, but I think what, what is necessary in terms of monitoring, both for your publications and for data, is, um, is to know where, th where these things lie. Otherwise, you will be unable to monitor. It's very obvious. So if you say you may, you may deposit in every repository you wish, subsequently you will not be able to monitor this. And this is very clear. So if you want to have a monitoring mechanism, you will need to know where your things are. So um, you have three institutions with, um, with uh, repositories. Uh, you may devise one national one and or assign to the University of Cyprus to host the other institutions or whatever. You can find a collaborative way, but you need to know where your things are. So, when, so, so minimally, they should be deposited in, I would say, in specific repositories and then wherever else they want. But if you don't keep track of where, the, in which repositories they are, you will be, it's very clear, you will not be able to monitor. So this is, uh, I think, a piece of advice. And for research data, I mean, there is Zenodo, for example. And I don't think that all uh, UK, it's in, I mean, we were looking through Recode for developing the policies quite extensively at their policies. Not all of them, for research data is a more particular case. They don't have research data repositories. Some of them have registries, right? I mean, you have, they have distributed infrastructure, so they know, they know where the data lie. So they may have a research uh, data registry, but uh, they may not necessarily have their own uh, data so repository. Just, just very quickly, um, because I th there's a point coming from the front. Um, there is a very fundamental difference between publications and data, and that is that it's accepted best practice for the, the ideal home of, uh, of publications to be in an institutional repository. Uh, for data, it's better for it to be in a disciplinary uh, uh, organized repositories. A problem with that is that not every discipline is as well served with institutional, uh, uh, with uh, domain level repositories. So if you look at the biosciences, dozens, maybe even hundreds, uh, if you look at high energy physics, dozens, maybe even hundreds. If you look at the arts and humanities, not, not so many. <laughs> um, so that, that's why services like Zenodo and possibly national catch-all or institutional catch-all data uh, uh, archives are important so that you don't get the, the, the situation where you've got homeless or orphan uh, data sets. I, I, and as Victoria says, uh, the, the catalog is key. There's no obligation uh, that I'm aware of for every institution to store its own data. It needs to know where the data is. And that's why catalogs are important and, and registries and things like that. Um, so so uh, uh, it's also not necessary for most funders to have a situation whereby somebody has an interest in the data and they can immediately go and click and immediately download the data. That's obviously, it would be great if that was possible, but that all costs money and takes time. And lots of data is stored a little bit below the surface and takes a little while to get out of the cold storage, if you like. So. Um, so, so uh, pe pe people, pe people are at risk of being very hard on themselves, and I say, I say you know, just <laughs> relax, you know, you, you, we'll get there. There is not any question, but it's uh, proposed. So let's hold the three institutional repositories that already exist. Uh, I would like to inform that another one is planning to come for a private university. Uh, additionally, I suggest the main schema of uh, European, we can hold a central aggregator here in Cyprus, mainly can uh, support it from the University of Cyprus. But the, the action data have to be at the repositories. That, I agree with that. Uh, and then the aggregator has to connect it with the repositories at each institution. And then uh, create the national repository and the national research created in Cyprus by the Cypri uh, Cypriot uh, um, researchers. So that is my opinion, and I believe that is the beginning of uh, that uh, issue and, the, and this year afternoon. Yeah, we already have some discussions, and uh, we will continue with this schema in our plans. Thank you. 
didn't, we didn't, we didn't decide uh, yet on the monitoring uh, mechanism and maybe the creation of a um, national repository, but we have the issue of cost that is very crucial. I mean, it's, it will be very difficult to create anything that will cost a lot of money uh, to the government. I mean, we'll not find any support. So we have to find um, a solution um, within this framework. I think the infrastructure already are... Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, at the institutional level. This is not possible now, okay, fine, it could be in five years, but until that time, you have enough infrastructures, I think, yeah. so that you can, you know, assign to one to also take care of some of another institution until that finds itself, so that they can have a deposit space and that this can be tracked and that you can know that you can monitor um, the compliance to your policy. This is very important. I think uh, as a funder, you have... Um, uh, great power and responsibility, and I think uh, the institutions are ready and willing to follow here. Cyprus is a good case of a small country where people collaborate very well uh, um, between each other. So I think it will very likely be successful. And the other important thing, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this later in the afternoon, is try to see how this can be connected to, to evaluation. It's very important also. I know it is, but I mean, a national policy, you don't need to require it. You need how you can reserve your rights to it, however. How about that? You can reserve your rights. The policy document will meet with a lot of opposition. I mean, we have to introduce this policy very softly if we don't want to, you know, to block it. Yes. We have the ability, we are as an institutions mature enough to understand the need and to decide how to proceed. And it it's time. a matter of time also. So it takes 10 years, I think, I calculated this, unless you're in the UK. Well, unless in the UK has this twisted thing where everyone says, you should give to the researchers incentives. And this what? Well, and the UK comes to the incentive is, of course, that the funder says that you should do it. Well, this is not the incentive. This is the stick note for the UK is the incentive. Yeah. Anyway, but it's, uh, the UK is much faster than this is. But uh, in other countries, I think it takes about 10 years. So <laughs> if we are in the yeah. other one. <laughs> no, no, you, you're not. Two. You're, you, no, no, more than that. Yeah, three, four, or something like <laughs> yeah. that. So mm -hmm. there is still some time. But Okay, thank you. We have uh, other questions? No?